tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are dancer Palmer Davis and artist, musician, designer Antoine Bonsorte. Dancer, actress Palmer Davis was raised in San Diego. She spent her childhood in dance classes. She graduated from UCLA with a major in dance and a minor in Spanish. You've seen her dance on award shows, TV shows, on the stage, on the road. She's been uh, what? A rocket. Yes. <laughs> and she's acted in TV series. She had a recurring role in CSI, CSI Las seven Vegas. Seasons. Seven mm -hmm. seasons. And yeah. she's a choreographer and a teacher. And a writer now. And you're a writer. <laughs> and you, you're create you created actually Palmer a dance program at St. Cyril uh, of Jerusalem School. What was yeah. that about? Well, it, it's basically about, um, in private schools and public schools, the, the, the funding for arts is pretty much nil. And part of my soapbox is, you know, we say no to drugs. We want our kids to have, um, uh, build self-confidence. And I said, well, why don't we teach them skills? Why don't we teach them dance? Which is learning about how to um, control your body, respect the space, respect one another, and feel comfortable so when they get older, they have dance moves. They can do a cha-cha, a waltz, rather than some of the freak dancing that they kind of just rely on these days. So what do we call that when we add that to your bio? <laughs> Title. <laughs> it's called trying to save American youth. <laughs> but was that because you have two little kids? Is that how you got interested? Well, yes. My my kids do go there. I have a six and an eight year old now. Yeah. And uh, it just sort of started, and I, I didn't feel right about only doing one class. I thought, well, let's do kindergarten through eighth grade. And I started oh. during their PE class just twice a month, and then I started cotillion. Well, it's a very loose term of cotillion, <laughs> but just to make sure they can get some of the essentials of basic box, step, waltz. How do you find you know. time to do that? I mean, well, that is very time consuming. It's like a full time job teaching. Well, if something needs to be done, you find the time to do it. I think, yeah. So. <laughs> and, and you've continued your dancing yeah. from the, your childhood days. Yes. And maybe this helps you keep your dance going, teaching like this. It does. Uh, I think anybody who does teach or mentor, you're always, as you're instructing the other kids or adults, you remind yourself of certain things, whether it's to be passionate, whether it's to keep a clean line, whether it's to interpret the dance as an actor, whatever it is, it's always a reminder for yourself. As a dancer, which you started out to be, mm -hmm. did you think your career would be expanded like this? Um, with all those things that With everything <laughs> else. Um, that was, my mom certainly did. She did? Yeah, she always figured I'd make a great director, maybe because I was so bossy and oh. outspoken. <laughs> but what about dancers? Why do they say dancers can't act? That's always the thing, right? You're a dancer and you don't make that transition into acting, which well, you have done, but I mean, right. most dancers... It's it, getting the opportunity to, and um, yes, the dancer has to take the responsibility to um, get into acting class and realize it is a different medium. Ah. But once that is accomplished, I say give them a shot. Just because they look fantastic, they take care of their body, they can do miraculous things with them, uh, with their bodies, um, why can't they do you it all? You address that, don't you? Yes, I in do. In your suburban showgirl play, a one-person play. It's almost two yeah. hours long, isn't it? Yeah, it's about an hour, 35, hour, 40, it, yeah, it was I, pretty, <laughs> I was like, pretty long. Did you have yeah. to get, did you, do you warm up before you go on the stage? Yeah, I have a ritual. It's a little different doing it in my um, later years than my early years, because um, I do throw myself around like a 20-year-old. Uh, but I, I go to the gym, I do the, the bicycle, take a steam, and <laughs> get ready. And, and get ready to go on? Yeah, yeah, it's a full warm-up. 
That's yeah. so great because yeah. you burst onto the stage. Should we tell them from the outside? Yes. <laughs> she comes running through the door and onto the stage and she takes charge takes immediately. Charge. Um, when you were in dance classes or mm -hmm. dancing on stage, does a dancer stand out? Is there some kinds of ways that you kind of like are nudging the other ones to, to have yourself shown? Well, <laughs> there's, you know, the, there's an evolution of that. Absolutely, when you're younger, your camera time is yes. so limited. So you're always trying to get that one little extra shoulder in or something to get, you figure out where the, uh, the star is. But as you get older, you realize, you know what, where it's a paycheck, you do your job, and, you know, let's be professional. <laughs> but, on the stage, but on the stage, you and get honest, your full time. Yes, and you're the on, only one there. On the stage, yeah, you, you just, you want to shine, you do your best, and I think that's why uh, dancers are so vivacious. They're used to working hard, and um, there's an energy that emanates from them. I'm going to just run through some of these pictures yes. that were on the sh on. Yes. That you play because you play how many characters? Twenty eight characters, in your show? and it's called Suburban yeah. Showgirl. Suburban Showgirl. And yeah. uh, who directed it? Well, Leslie. I'll go through. I'll just. Okay, Leslie Wells, upside down. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Leslie Wells, a fantastic director, uh, stepped in after Richard Klein, uh, who is renowned for oh. Three's Company, is playing Larry. Um, started my process as a writer, and into a year in the project, he moved to New York, and then I started with Leslie. And this is when we finally get to the showgirl segment here. This is almost at the end, right? Yes, no, we have a few. This is Tilly Peterson, a La Jolla snotty housewife who uh, scoffs at me for doing a menial dance job. How did you learn to use different kinds of voices for these characters? You, well, <laughs> you just do. You, you learn to work with your register, you know, a little bit oh. higher. Some of the kids, there's a naivety. You get, that's the Sid Charisse. And, uh, Sid Charisse is behind the screen, and yes. she looks fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> we do a wonderful silhouette with her, uh, where her leg appears out of nowhere. And uh, here's your showgirl one again, getting dressed. Yeah. Yes, getting ready for the Will Rogers Follies. That was my big breakthrough oh, yeah. as a singer. I was going to ask you about that. Tell us about that, because since we're talking about it. Yeah, then. as a, as a singer, it was never my strong point, and uh, one of my biggest fears just getting through a song without forgetting the words. And this is such a small muscle and all the tension, it just really stifled me. And uh, finally, Will Rogers Follies um, with Tommy Toon directing, um, finally got my big Broadway touring break. And what does it take to be a Broadway star? What do you think it takes? Because if you're dancing mm -hmm. and you're in shape and you're tall right. and you look great and you know how to do all the moves, you remember everything, what right. is that extra little thing that I, I think Broadway performers and anybody who does eight shows a week has a huge heart. <laughs> they themselves? I, they themselves have a huge heart because when you're doing it for camera, you do maybe one tough day, 20 takes, whatever, fine, it's done. But a Broadway performer will go out no matter what is happening during their day. What has happened, you know, in terms of oh. issues and whatever. Personal. They're going to go out there and say, this person paid a full price ticket and I'm going to give 100% every single show, whether it's eight shows a week or for the Rockettes, 15, 20 shows a week, it gets ridiculous. And it's their huge heart saying, I am not going to skimp on any, any show because I want to give. So you think you. that that thing in the person is then can be read by the director or the people? Oh, yeah. That's what yes. gets you hired back. That's what I wondered. Yeah. You're always auditioning. You talked about Tommy Toon. So if you went before Tommy Toon again, he would know what you could do and how you did it. Yeah, well, it's and been so remember. long. It's been so long since Tommy, but he would remember. Rob but, Marshall is yeah, one. Rob Marshall from and what? Chicago? Did he do Chicago? He did Chicago. I did Movie of the Week, um, Cinderella, and uh, Mrs. Santa Claus with him. But here you are. Yeah. You're up against uh, people who are on Broadway, like Sutton right. Foster. You talk about right. her in your show. How did that yes, happen? Yes, she was 17 years old. This is a, a Tony Award winning, winning actress, um, singer, beautiful, lovely lady. And she was standing next to me. She's 17, just still in high school. And they called our names Ford. And I'll never forget, she's in her little biker shorts and leotard. And she goes, 
so what does this mean? So, and I look at her, I go, you got the job, honey. Like I was so jaded and old, you know, I was still wet behind the ears, but uh, she was And she's still charming. there dancing. She's still there. I saw her when she did Young Frankenstein, when she did the, uh, or, um, um, the Thirdly? rehearsals, the mm -hmm. before. Drowsy Chaperone and Three. I saw her in that, Nelly. yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, in Young Frankenstein in Seattle. Okay. But your show goes through, and I love the way on stage you have your sh your shoes. Yes. And your shoes tell the story. They do tell a story. Hold, the story, hold those up and well, just show. I described the first experience why I started dancing because my neighborhood girlfriend had a cute outfit and she got to wear ribbons on her ballet slippers. So there you are. These were my very first pair. My first pair of toe shoes, which I did not do in the show. It's the only I did not oh, do you point didn't do work. This. But you know, <laughs> and they're all worn and they're, they're all used shoes. Yes, right? these are my trick tap shoes. Um, it, the, there's shoeography. Oh, I see that. And this change is so quick, I velcroed elastic onto them because literally it's a, it's a 10 second if, if I wondered even how you got in and out so fast because you're like talking and doing yeah. plies and putting, putting it's these It's a on. whole shoeography. Uh -huh. And these, um, I wore these in a film once, and these heels, 12 hour days, that was just excruciating. <laughs> And the last pair? Yes. These, these are just gorgeous shoes. Carabelle sponsored some of a Carabelle dance wear. Oh, they sponsored did. some of my costumes, absolutely. And uh, these just look so hot with fishnets, so I had to put them in. I think this, <laughs> before we leave, I think this tells the story about your Velcro, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, is, um, this is the suburban show mom right here, um, trying to do it all. I was nursing and auditioning at an audition three weeks after I uh, had the baby determined, three weeks, determined to get back into the workforce. And this, that, this was that character. That was that story. And the last thing, why is it inspired by Einstein dance? <laughs> or why are you inspired? Well, you know, Einstein did not stop. It, it did, the theory of relativity didn't just happen. He worked at it and worked at it and thought, it, and it's the same thing with life. Once we think we've mastered something, it, it goes beyond. And mastering a passion and art, it, it's, you know, it's endless. Just and you say dance is a universal formula? Dance is the universal language. Oh, the language. The language that be, can, can be used throughout your life. And do you use it? I do. I you do, do don't Metaphorically you? and just as therapy. And whenever I'm down and having a hard day, I can always know, let me go into the wood floors, let me have my bar, let me have the music and I have the freedom of dance and makes me feel better. Oh, well, we have to see Suburban Showgirl. Yes, thank you so do. much, Palmer. Thank you, Joan, it's a pleasure. And thanks for watching this part of the show. We'll be right back with Antoine Bonsorte, who did the photograph on the set, and you'll find out how he did it. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with photographer, designer, musician, artist, Antoine Bonsorte. He was born in Tunisia, where his father was an accomplished furniture maker. He taught his son, Antoine, the fine craft of woodwork. His family moved to Italy, France, and South America. Antoine went to university in France, where he studied music and he's presented, uh, he's practiced his passion for music for the last 20 years in the U.S. Uh, how do you feel as a gypsy <laughs> moving all through those places? Was it hard for you as a child? It was actually enriching, I would say. It's been unstable but very nurturing to uh, you know several cultures and being adapted from very young. It, it just opened up my world, actually. Were you there in each place long enough to learn to speak the languages? Yes, I was. And why were you moving so much? Well, the first time was actually an independence war. Oh, 
is that right? In North Africa, and the uh, second time it was just to join the family. We were in Italy, we wanted to join the rest of the family in France. Oh, I see. So were you following your path, your music path at the time? I was very young at the time, but I started uh, t as a teenager uh, in loving music and knowing that I would pursue that. And what did you, what do you do? Do you play? Do you sing? I do play. I play. Do you write I compose. music? I write music. You compose, mm -hmm. I see. You went uh, to the Dick Grove Music School in San Fernando Valley. That's, That's a true. very famous school. How did you find it? Well, it was, uh, you know, when I came here, it was in the valley, I was there, and it was the most convenient and actually the best school I've ever attended to. It's unfortunate it's not existing anymore. It's not, but I've had other musicians on, and mm -hmm. they've gone to that school too, and uh, they had gone to that school, and it seemed like you had such a fine education. It is. Um, y you've had commissions from many important people. Um, to do certain things like Armani and Ford and Coca-Cola. What did you do for Armani? Well, I started here as an art director in the film industry and I uh, became a designer as a production designer in the film industry and a designer for several events. And um, I had the occasion to work for these people to create wonderful environments for them. Like Ford too? Same for thing? yes, um, for the fire and ice ball, as an example, and uh, that was Revlon, right? Revlon, Revlon, did the fire. correct. Yes, correct. So worked for Revlon too. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what were you doing? Creating atmospheres, or were you doing mm. commercials? Well, I was designing environments for their events as well as uh, sets for movies and TV oh, and commercials. Because you worked on Batman and um, several movies, Star Wars? I did. I do did. Doing the same Still kind of thing? Yes, specifically uh, specializing at the end into carving and sculpting. Is that right? So mm -hmm. what would you do for something like, say, Baywatch or Star Trek? What kind of... Uh, you do assignments uh, to uh, design a set, uh, oh. to build, uh, and to build the sets. I think the interesting thing is the casinos and the hotel in Las Vegas. They give you that kind of... Uh, yes, they give you that kind of power in, in designing and creating an environment that is really inducing to uh, the purpose. Was it yes. hard? I it mean, was sometimes challenging. <laughs> it was sometimes challenging. Very interesting. And a spa, would it be the same kind of thing? I mean, uh, hotels are so different in different areas. Yes. Um, yes, I. It's been a good experience, but I've moved from that kind of work to now um, more of a visual and music oriented work. Tell us about that, because I think that's what happens in this. Yes, this, um, yes. This is like a culmination DVD, of right? That's right, a DVD. <laughs> Not a CD, a DVD. No, a DVD. This is a, actually a film, a visual journey of very harmonic uh, imagery uh, inspired from nature. Tell us, I, I played it last night, and it's like a kaleidoscopic journey. How do you get all that? that I'm going to just show this. How well, do you get all that color and movement and the way it works with the sound? <laughs> well, the beginning was just to uh, illustrate the relation between nature and uh, art. And then uh, it became, it produced so much beauty that it became a piece on itself. And the technique made it um, very um, very inspiring in the sense where it did af effect on the mind and the breathing just by watching and the meditation it? yes just by watching and it. it's called breath of light it is called the breath breath of light because it seems that it's a breathing lighting being and these things that we have on the set are going on the screen the whole That's time right. with different kinds of music. At a slow pace, they transform one into another. It, it, it's interesting because I, when you watch the beginning, it looks like this, and then at the end, it gets circular, like the end of your life, <laughs> like the end of the 
like the light yeah it just at the changed end of the so tunnel. different is that that's right it's a journey it's made to take you to different places into your own spirit and so mind all of these you created yes these are all images from the film and and do these have specific um, titles or reasons for being like this uh, they're just this? Uh, they're just uh, picked from uh, from the film uh, as example of the myriad of different images that are there this um, this high I'm gonna hold I'm just a Antoine I'm gonna hold sure. these up like this and then we can go through them and you can talk mm -hmm. about them these are high definition images uh, that um, are uh, put together to create a peaceful visual journey. Um, as music, you could listen to you could listen to music several times, a song many times in a day, and this work uh, allows you to do that in the sense where it is so rich and so peaceful that you can see this work over and over again. You don't have to be in a private little room or anything. You could be working in your house while you're watching That's this. right. You can, you can have this as a background uh, or you can also sit down in front of it and just watch it thoroughly and watch it several times. Who and composed it, the music? Uh, my very dear friend Craig Collin and Michelin Dream who have made Shaman's Dream um, have uh, part of this music and then my own music. And I have done this work with my very dear friend uh, Abram Zinberg. He collaborated with you? Who has collaborated with me in every sense of it. H how do you get this image? Where is this? Is this image on the computer? Yes, these images are from nature, f photography of nature, oh. and there are layers of different pictures, one Your into another. Your my photographs. I see, so they're la it's a process it's, of... It's a process of layering and giving movement and um, to induce a feeling of uh, peaceful meditation. And when you have, a, you're having an exhibition, you're having an exhibition of these pieces. So th this is actually your artwork That's we're right. looking at, right? Yes, this is the artwork and the film itself is the main piece. The, the film is the main piece and then it's, right. it's like Christo who wraps a building and then he takes pictures and it becomes part of the art project. That's so true. would you be showing these? Yes, we will. Where will you show these? We're going to show this at my studio in Santa Monica on Lincoln Boulevard on the December 8th. And um, what else will be there besides the photographs? There will be uh, several projections uh, of the film uh, in different uh, parts of the movie. So it will be like an uh, moving art space. So it, it's not going to be like a meditation space. It's going to be more of a situation where people are at an art show. Like an art show. And you can, you will be able to meditate if that's what you are feeling for, as well as just uh, viewing some very pleasing imagery. You um, took a lot of photographs. Where did you take these photographs? All over the world, really in Latin America, here in Europe. Where were your so favorite places? I love South America, I gotta Where? say, I have a tendency. Brazil, um, Peru. Did the, oh, Peru. Did mm -hmm. the colors change for you when you're taking photographs? Yes, they do. Every place has its own miraculous light. And then you, and then do you mix different countries <laughs> When yes. you put them on your computer? Yes, actually, there is in the computer, there's no more limit in mixing and changing and combining. And it's actually all this culture come together for uh, the goal of making beauty. And I, um, I think that this, is, this work uh, is actually bringing a new way at looking at uh, a television. Well, that's an interesting point, because uh, you look at this color all the time, but it's not mixed the way you're looking at it. It's actually bringing a different feeling about television. It's not something that uh, you are bringing, you are taking to, it's something that you are receiving from, something that brings you inward 
and uh, open a space in you and rest you and, and opens a peaceful, meditative uh, ambience. Talking about that and talking about bringing things to you, you're a big activist in the Amazon. You're even named as a, an ambassador for helping there. What do you do in that capacity? I work with several uh, environmental organizations and I document um, the damages that oil companies and uh, woodcutters oh. do in Amazon. Oh. And, uh, and we bring these documents back to the United States and we show the corporation what they're doing and uh, we help stopping those development in Amazon. And this work actually is dedicated to nature and it's made for people to uh, be really aware of the sacredness of nature and the very drastic moments we're living now. We're living now. And um, I hope that it will bring that inspiration in bringing nature and the spirits together. When you go down there, is there any opposition to your coming down and photographing it or being a part of it? Well, there is always an opposition from the corporation who are working That's there, but I there wondered. is a great welcoming from the indigenous people. Yes. <laughs> and that really, will, really counts for me. So do you continue to do that? Yes, I continue to do that. And uh, do you find new spots, like hot spots to go to? Well, I actually follow up mostly with some places that I have been working with before, and we are actually intending to create an ecotourism system for a tribe in Amazon called the Atuars. Can you see where damage has been done and where over the years it's starting to replenish itself? Has that started yet? Started to replenish itself, not yet, not unfortunately. Yet. We're really looking forward to something like that. <laughs> but that's the idea, right? That is definitely the idea, yes. Well, you brought so much to us today, and I thank you very, very much, Antoine, for explaining all of this. It's so beautiful, and it added so much to the set. Thank you so much. Joan. Thank you. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. Bye. I'll hold this up again.